Thank you, everyone, for being here. We're so grateful for your time today. I'm Nulo O'Connor. I'm the president of the Center for Democracy and Technology. We have an incredible panel here to talk with us about the many, many recent proposals involving national surveillance and the NSA. Let me start with my immediate right. Many of you know David Medin, who is the current chair of the P Club. David has had an illustrious career in private practice and in government over the many years, um, but in recent months has been at the center of uh, the dialogue around the reform of our intelligence services. To his right, we have Steve Bradbury. Steve is currently a partner at Deckert. Many of you know the law firm, but he is also known for his work at the Office of Legal Counsel in the U.S. Department of Justice, where he was Principal Deputy Assistant Attorney General from 2004 to 2009 and Acting Assistant Attorney General from 2005 to 2007. To his right, my friend Michelle Richardson from the ACLU, where she is the Legislative Counsel, and she focuses on national security and government transparency, including the Patriot Act, FISA, cybersecurity, state secrets, and FOIA. And net last but not least, Judge Carr. James Carr is the federal district judge for the United States District Court of the Northern District of Ohio. Uh, he was nominated and joined the court in 1994, uh, nominated by President Clinton. And uh, he is known for his recent writings on this uh, topic, and we are looking forward to hearing his views about the structural issues involving FISA. And with that, I've asked each of the panelists to speak for a few minutes about their viewpoint and their uh, thoughts on the recent proposals from many different sources, and then we'll have some Q&A, including Q&A from the audience. David? All right, thanks, Nula. Um, first, let me start with a uh, disclaimer, which is that my uh, views today don't necessarily represent the views of the Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board um, or its members. And for those of you who have read our report, you'll know, at least in part, that that's certainly the case. Um, uh, I also wanted to thank uh, the folks to my right, all of whom have had some input into our, our report. Um, they don't bear any responsibility for the output, um, but they were provided valuable contributions to our thought process. Um, uh, as you uh, know, we, the uh, P Club issued a report last week on the Section 215 uh, program and on the operations of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court. Um, so I wanted to just briefly go through uh, our thoughts on, on uh, those as well as the recommendations we made uh, regarding government transparency of surveillance programs. Um, on the 215 program, there's been a lot of news about uh, our conclusions about the legality of the program, uh, but I also wanted to focus today um, on another important part of our analysis, which is the privacy and civil liberties analysis as well. Uh, our main function is to focus on the balance between national security and privacy and civil liberties, although our statute also calls upon us uh, to evaluate compliance with applicable laws and in, in, in overseeing programs. Um, with regard to the privacy issues on the 215 program, as you know, the, the program collects uh, telephone metadata, not the content of phone calls, um, on virtually all calls that are made uh, in the United States. Uh, and we, want, we thought long and hard about the privacy consequences of that. Um, first, um, there are uh, the risks of uh, misuse. Um, as we point out in our report, uh, uh, in the 20th century, there, were, there, were, there was considerable misuse by the government accessing uh, information, whether it was the anti-war movement, civil rights leaders, um, or enemies lists of the government. And so while I think we've become used to a uh, benevolent government that, that it doesn't engage in those kinds of practices, you don't have to think very far back to a time when government abused this kind of data. And so allowing the government to collect everyday transactions about uh, Americans relating to their freedom of speech and association um, raises particular concerns of misuse going forward, and I think it's appropriate to keep that in mind as you structure programs in this area. Uh, there are also secondary uses of this information beyond counterterrorism uh, that require some thought as well. As uh, the program may have a could have a legitimate use on counterterrorism purposes, but if you start thinking about once it's collected, what other uses it may be put to, it certainly could raise concerns. Um, there's also the, the chilling effect, uh, uh, and while the, the board did not find either First or Fourth Amendment uh, violations, we, we did think that some of the policies behind in the First and Fourth Amendment did have some impact on our privacy analysis, and, and a, chill, a chilling effect is certainly uh, central to that. Um, I think it's appropriate here in the museum uh, to talk about the chilling effect that uh, government's collection of information could have on sources contacting journalists, uh, knowing that there's a record of those uh, transactions that, that's kept by the government. Um, the same could be true with activists organizing protests. 
uh, people with religious uh, or inclinations uh, associating with each other, and on and on and on, things that you may just not want the government to know about um, that could make you think twice about exercising your First Amendment rights of speech and association. Um, and so we took that very much to heart in thinking about uh, the balance in this program. And then more generally, I think as, as follow-up on that, uh, there is a shift in power between citizens and the government that takes place when the government collects information about everyone's transactions. Um, and uh, I think in this country we've had a, a very healthy um, concern about government information practices. One of our first national privacy laws was the Privacy Act, which regulated government information, not the private sector. We also have the Right to Financial Privacy Act. Um, and so we have a healthy skepticism that I think is important to continue. Um, so those are uh, s some of the privacy concerns and civil liberties concerns that we thought about. But balancing those um, certainly is national security, which is also a vital national interest. And, and we carefully looked at the efficacy of this program uh, because a, a particularly efficacious program might well justify some of the concerns that I've raised before. Um, however, we found that the program had very limited benefits. Uh, as our report indicated, uh, that no, no plots were thwarted, no terrorists were. Uh, identified as a result of the program. Um, but we didn't stop there in our analysis of its efficacy. We looked at uh, the peace of mind concern, which is that knowing that there isn't a plot underway can help uh, allocate government resources appropriately. Uh, and that certainly is an important thing, but we believe that that could be accomplished by other means. Um, there's also a material assistance case that was brought using this information. Again, an important uh, law to enforce, but we, we also believe that other legal authorities uh, could substantially achieve the same goals. Um, and so given uh, the, what we viewed as a strong uh, privacy concern and a, and a weak efficacy case, we felt that on, on the privacy of civil liberties versus national security balance uh, did not justify the continuation of this program. Um, we did as also conduct a, a legal analysis of Section 215, and I won't go into detail, but, but Section 215 requires a number of, uh, the government meet a number of concerns or standards in order to operate the program, uh, and we felt that, that in many cases those were not met. Um, there's also the Electronic Communications Privacy Act, which restricts telephone companies from even disclosing information to the government, and there's no exception under that law for the 215 program. Um, and so on, on legal basis, we also felt the program was not justified in, in continuing. And, um, and then, uh, as I mentioned before, we did a constitutional analysis uh, on the Fourth Amendment side. Uh, there is clear Supreme Court law, Smith v. Maryland, that would seem to support the program, but we do think that the trend in the courts may be to revisit that and either distinguish it um, or overrule it. On the First Amendment side, again, we didn't come to conclusions, but other than to note, um, as I mentioned, the chilling effect, um, uh, which we think in this particular case outweighs a very compelling national security interest given the effectiveness of the program. And so the majority uh, of the board would terminate the program, um, but the board unanimously felt that there should be at least a period where added privacy protections uh, are added to the program, and those included reducing record retention from five years to three years and the number of hops from three to two. Um, changing over to the FISC, uh, as a result of our uh, public workshops that we held and hearing from uh, former FISC judges like Judge Carr um, and two others, one in public session, one in private session, uh, we came to the conclusion unanimously that the FISC could benefit from having another voice uh, on government applications involving novel legal and technological issues. Uh, and so our proposal is to create a panel of outside lawyers, of special advocates, um, that are chosen by the court uh, to be members of the panel, and then individual judges can inc include those special advocates in proceedings, again, that involve programmatic approvals or other types of matters that involve uh, novel or uh, legal or technological issues. Uh, and we also tried to propose a mechanism by which appeals could be heard. There have only been two appeals ever from FISC decisions to the FISCER, which is the Court of Review, uh, and we think appellate review is an important part of the judicial system and even the opportunity uh, for Supreme Court review. And so we've proposed what I think is a constitutional method for allowing the, that process to work and, and have appeals. Um, and then the last I wanted to talk about transparency. Uh, I think one of the lessons we've learned here is that greater transparency would benefit everybody um, in this process. And so on the court decision side, um, we recommend that FISC decisions in the future be written with a view towards declassification and publication, um, uh, which we think is, is practical. Going backward, we realize those decisions weren't written that way, but we'd still encourage uh, declassification of important FISC decisions recognizing that that's a time-consuming and burdensome process, but if there are key decisions that could benefit the public debate, uh, we think those should be declassified as well. Uh, and then lastly, 
uh, I think one of the things we've learned here is that it's important to have transparency with regarding our laws, and there shouldn't be secret laws that, that authorize programs where you can't tell from the face of the law that the a program's been authorized. Um, we do recognize national, serious national um, security concerns, and so don't, we don't think the details of programs need to be spelled out in the laws, but the laws should clearly authorize the broad area of government activity, um, even if the details remain classified. Um, so with that, I'm happy to pass it on. Steve? Thanks. Thanks, David. Um, I agree with uh, President Obama. Uh, a week ago Friday, in his speech at the Department of Justice, I think he presented a fairly stirring defense of the National Security Agency programs, including the telephone metadata program that um, David was focusing most uh, particularly on. And I think it's very clear that President Obama taking a look at these issues, has concluded, number one, that both the telephone metadata program and the other big NSA program that has been disclosed by Edward Snowden's leaks, and that's the program that is targeted at non-U.S. persons believed to be overseas and their international communications that may come in or out of the U.S., that's a program that, unlike the metadata program, actually collects con content. It's pretty clear that President Obama concluded that both of these programs are lawful uh, in all respects. I think uh, that if he believed these programs were unlawful, as the Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board has concluded, or a majority of the board has concluded for the telephone metadata program, he would have stopped them. Similarly, it's clear from his statements that he's concluded that both of these programs continue to be necessary to protect the nation from foreign attack. Um, again, I believe if the president felt that the programs were not necessary to continue in their current form, he would have shut one or both of the programs down, particularly the telephone metadata program because of all of the controversy and debate that has been engendered uh, by, the, by the program. Three, I think it's it's clear, and he said so, that the president concluded that there's no evidence that either of these programs has uh, been abused by the NSA. There's not been any intentional abuse, misuse of the programs to target uh, people in the U.S. for political reasons or any other improper reasons. There has certainly been significant compliance issues that the court has uh, weighed in on in very, in, uh, very strong terms but those were not intentional abuses of the program. So lawful in all respects, necessary to protect the country, and um, <clears throat> not abused. Um, that being the case, I disagree very strongly with the majority report uh, from David's board uh, suggesting that we shut down the metadata program and that it's uh, unlawful under the statute. The statute enables the FBI, in this case, it's the FBI on behalf of the NSA, to apply for a business records order to be approved by the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court to obtain business records from a company. In this case, we're talking about the transactional records of telephone calls, not the content, but what number has called what number, when, and for how long. Just that uh, data about communications. That's the metadata. Not doesn't allow anybody to listen in or read anybody's messages or listen to any phone calls. Um, the FISA court can approve the acquisition of business records like that, transactional records for the NSA, if they are relevant to an authorized counterterrorism investigation. This is very similar to the broad civil, investiga civil investigatory demand authority, the CID or subpoena, administrative subpoena authority that many federal agencies have to conduct all manner of investigations. Securities and Exchange Commission, Federal Trade Commission, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, lots of federal agencies conduct very broad investigations of industries and gather vast amounts of data, uh, including entire databases, where they need to do so in order to pre preserve and be able to run searches to find particular records that may be in that database that are germane to an authorized investigation. That's fairly standard authority that agencies exercise. Now, 
So the question of relevance, I think, is, is there's a strong ground uh, for the relevance of the, of the data here. The entire database is necessary for the NSA to be able to find connections to known terrorist numbers. In other words, phone numbers that we have a reasonable basis to believe or reasonable suspicion are associated with a particular foreign terrorist organization. And the question is, have those numbers been used to contact anybody in the United States uh, or others of interest? And we need to find those connections in order to discover new phone numbers that, that we don't already know in order to uh, discover new cells we may not have known about and protect against uh, unfolding plots. Uh, the president said uh, and others have said that if we had had this telephone metadata program prior to 9-11, it might have prevented 9-11 and it might prevent the next 9-11. I think the question of the necessity of the program is also uh, not fairly measured simply by whether the use of this database has been the one final piece of evidence that stopped the bomb from going off at the last minute. I don't think that's a correct measure of necessity. It's a question of whether it's had, whether it's been an input in counterterrorism investigations. I think it's, it is a regular input in lots of investigations where they tip numbers to the FBI. And I think the president clearly came to that conclusion that it was necessary. It's not appropriate for national security to, to stop this, uh, program. And contrary to the conclusion of the PCLOB on the legal question, six, 15, I believe it is, 15 different federal district judges who sit on the FISA court on 37 separate occasions since 2006 have concluded that this program is lawful under the statute and under the Fourth Amendment. No court has concluded that it violates the statute. The decision by Richard Lee, Judge Richard Leon here in, in D.C. was focused on the constitutional question, uh, not on the statutory question, which was the basis for the PCLOB uh, conclusion. The last thing I want to say is just very quickly, the president, I think unfortunately though, went on to propose some changes in the program that I think could affect the effectiveness of the program and the security of the data. <laughs> Uh, he's requiring that the NSA get court approval before it queries the database. I think that could cause a delay and reduce potentially the effectiveness uh, of the use of the database. It needs to be used, as the president said, quickly and flexibly in order to be effective. Uh, number two, uh, the reduction from three hops to two hops, I, I think again that has the potential to reduce the effectiveness and the utility and I don't think uh, there's a strong basis for doing that. Finally, he's ordered the Attorney General and the Director of National Intelligence to work on uh, uh, whether there's a way to move the data from the possession of the NSA to the possession of some, into private hands. Um, I think the only way that, I don't really think that could be effective. I think the only way it would work is if it were a private contractor holding the database in some suburban office park somewhere with a connection to the NSA. I think inevitably the database would be less efficient, but also more importantly it would be less secure. I think it would be more susceptible to hacking, to incursions from foreign governments, the Chinese, the Russians, potential terrorist uh, uh, attack, and also uh, Congress could address this issue, but it would be potentially subject to discovery and private civil litigation, which would be a serious issue in terms of the privacy. And there would be less effective oversight of the private contractors who are having access to the database. So I think and ultimately, I think there's actually a good chance the president's team will conclude that that's not a workable option and that it won't actually happen. Um, and I think that would probably be a good thing because I think the data would be less, uh, less secure. So I guess I'll stop there and be happy to answer questions afterwards. Thank you, Michelle? Thanks, Nula. Um, well, this has been a very exciting seven or eight months on the NSA area. We, we've worked for years as the ACLU on the Patriot Act, the FISA Amendments Act, and other types of spying authorities. And it's really only been in the last seven or eight months that we've had real concrete information about how these tools are being used, how broad they are, some first ideas about how many Americans are actually affected. And it's been astonishing. Um, we were very pleased at the reports that came out of the PCLOB and the President's Review Group, and we thought they were very thoughtful 
and they were very forward-leaning in their ideas on privacy. Um, most importantly, both groups really challenged the idea that collecting all of the information on the front end is an acceptable program. You know, they found that this program, the 215 phone records program, does not work. It does not actually result in leads, it does not catch terrorists, and in seven years cannot be used to find a single example of preventing a terrorist attack on U.S. soil. Um, the groups also found that there was just too big of a risk and that while there may not be evidence of intentional misconduct with that information now, that the very collection of it is an invasion of privacy. And probably most importantly, both groups started to undermine our endorsement of the third party doctrine. I think both groups said they would not make legal pronouncements, that they realized the courts are in a different place, but that the idea established in the 70s that digital information is not sensitive and isn't protected by the Fourth Amendment is going the way of the dodo. That it doesn't have as much application in 2014, that this information is incredibly sensitive, and the old lines we used to draw between content and data really just don't hold up, and it's very tenuous in the current state of technology. Um, we're very pleased that both groups unquestionably recommended the end to the bulk collection of the phone records. I think there has been some spinning in the press, especially around the review group, about what their recommendation was. But both entities found that this program should end. The risk to privacy are just too great. Um, we were also especially impressed with the way the Rude Group Group also looked at national security letters. It talked about pin registers and other similar tools. You know, the conversation has really focused around this phone records program under 215 of the Patriot Act, but really over the last seven or eight months, we've seen lots of programs come out, both through leaks, but also recognized by the intelligence community. And we realize there are many different domestic tools that it's been used for email and internet records collection. And once you get into the international space, whether that's under something like the FISA Amendments Act or even the more loosely regulated executive order, it's almost a free-for-all. And there are very few limita limitations that the targeting limitations are incredibly lax and minimization requirements that are supposed to be giving back-end protections are actually quite loose. And so with what's next, we are hoping that the conversation does broaden out. We're very pleased that the president <coughs> recognized that this data is sensitive <coughs> and that there is a threat with the government collection of this data in a bulk, suspicionless fashion. But the question next is, well, doesn't that also apply to other types of records? You know, we're at the State of the Net conference, right? Um, for any privacy risk that exists for phone records, it's exponentially greater for email and internet data, which is even richer than the phone records, right? The phone records definitely reflect associational activity possibly location, um, but the internet records and the email records also tell you so much about what people read, the political groups they're members of, where they go, do they have financial or mental health problems, incredibly sensitive data. And it's incredibly important that as we talk about 215, we continue to expand the conversation out to the many new programs that we have found out since the Snowden leaks. Um, the president didn't go into a huge amount of detail in his speech, but we understand that a number of different pieces of the administration have been tasked with putting into motion the review group recommendations. So for example, the recommendations about um, NIST and NSA and how we do um, security and cryptology on the internet has been farmed out to the cybersecurity czar, Michael Daniels, and NIST. Um, we know the PAB is going to be looking at whether we need definitions of content and records, that the President's Commission on Science and Technology is going to be looking at big data more broadly. And it's incredibly important that these groups really take a broader approach to privacy and start thinking about the long term. Um, there may not be intentional abuses now, but the very collection of the data is a violation in the first place. I think I'm perhaps most excited about congressional involvement in this area, and we're now up to close to 40 different bills between the House and the Senate, Democrat and Republican, and they range everything from 
dealing with the appointment process and confirmation process of FISA judges to substantive changes, transparency. And it's very clear that Congress is very displeased with how these programs have turned out. Many of them were not aware of the extent of the programs, and they now want to recalibrate them. Um, I, I think this has been put too much in black and white of whether the programs continue or they don't. Um, do we go dark? Do we tie the hands of our intelligence community? But that's not what these proposals would do. None of the proposals by the review groups or the ones that Congress is considering, they're actually much more modest. They don't fully repeal the Patriot Act or FISA Amendments Act, but instead say, use those tools in a more targeted fashion. Start with your seeds of terrorists, maybe go out one hop, but this collect it all mentality has got to stop and we have to be more focused in our collection. I know a lot of folks say that Congress will not act on this issue, but it is becoming an election issue. We are seeing more people, both Republican and Democrat, embrace the call for reform. Um, just last week, uh, the Republican National Committee actually made it part of its platform to repeal these programs and to conduct an investigation. There are almost 150 members of Congress who are cons uh, co-sponsoring major legislation that would make substantial and substantive changes to these programs to stop bulk collection. And it's very important that they get moving very soon. Um, we're in election year, and we realize that on a very practical level, in six months, uh, we get into the so-called silly season, right? And we really want the Judiciary and Intelligence Committees to start working on legislation now. That's important to make sure that these changes exist beyond any one administration. <laughs> it's important for Congress to reassert itself um, in an area that it has been far too deferential to the executive branch. And because it, this needs to be subject to public debate, these programs have been in the dark for way too long. Um, and as we've seen from what has been released over the last eight months, a lot of it was unnecessarily secret. There may have been some details in the Snowden release that might have related to sources and methods, but overwhelmingly we're looking at things that are very broad programmatic decisions that don't really identify targets or tip off terrorists. So, um, I guess the next steps, there is a hearing next week in the House Judiciary Committee. Um, we also understand that this will come up at Senate Judiciary with Attorney General Holder this week. And we expect Congress to get moving in the next few weeks and possibly start markups and see how they can move forward with reform efforts. And we're very happy to see that they are engaged and thinking substantively. And we're going to see what we can get this year. Thank you, Michelle. Judge Carr. Well, let me start by also by a disclaimer. I am not speaking on behalf of the judiciary or any part thereof. Uh, I'm here because I happened to write an op-ed and um, first time I ever tried something like that uh, in July and eight days later I found myself for the second and far happier time back in front of the Senate Judiciary Committee testifying about, about that proposal. And it's really not so much to reform NSA but to provide an opportunity for the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, I believe, to enhance its own work and uh, in a very, very modest way change uh, some of its procedures. And my proposal is very simple. It's already been somewhat alluded to already, and that is simply either to authorize or, as I've been thinking about it, perhaps under some circumstances, which I think can be readily defined, uh, require the judges of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court to uh, call upon the services of what I call outside counsel. Others call special advocate, amicus curiae or whatever. But as uh, was already mentioned, that perhaps this may create a panel like the Criminal Justice Act panel of pre-cleared, knowledgeable and experienced lawyers probably located here in the district, so they're readily at hand, whom under whatever the circumstances may be, uh, a judge, the court calls upon to uh, basically uh, not necessarily speak in opposition, but potentially speak in opposition to a government's proposal to a request and an application to conduct a particular kind of surveillance or program or whatever. Rule 11 of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act court rules already require the government, uh, and let me quote that for you so I get it correct. Uh, <coughs> Whenever the government submits a, a Rule 11 notice, which is, quote, whenever an application, quote, involves issues, an issue not previously presented to the court, 
including but not limited to a novel issue of technological technology or law, the government must inform the court in writing of the nature and significance of the issue. That rule, which I happened to write the original version of back in 2008 when I was on the court, basically codified prior practice uh, through my, throughout my term, and I think the other judges who have ever served in that court would agree. The government has constantly been entirely forthright. They would come in and say, Judge, you better look at paragraph 68, 66 to 82, because this is something new. And that rule codifies that uh, practice, and it seems to me that either the individual judge, and I think Congress has to authorize this because it does involve the disclosure outside the confines of the court to, uh, of classified information, and I'm no expert in this area, but I would have concerns in any event with any single Article III judge simply saying to the government, you've got to declassify all of this so that somebody else can come in and appear in front of me. So I think it's important that Congress uh, create this structure and authorize that kind of disclosure. And I do think that one of the things I want to emphasize, and I think it's very important, the need for this kind of outside input, whether you say it's representing the interests of the target, representing the interests of the Constitution, the interests of the public, the interests perhaps of the provider, um, it is a very, very rare instance when that is necessary. Um, there, th this came to me when I was serving on the court. There were a handful of times in my six years when I thought to myself, you know, I really would like to have somebody else in the room talking to me about this. That's how we judges make our minds up about something. You say this, you say that, well, what do you think about that? The other thing, of course, it would then provide the opportunity for an appeal to the uh, Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court of Review, which today, of course, only the government um, has the opportunity to engage in. But it would be a, it's a handful of cases. The vast majority of cases before the, any FISA judge, the FISA court, are fact-based. Very low standard of probable cause. Is the proposed target an agent of a foreign government or working on behalf of or affiliated with a foreign-based terrorist organization? There's no need to show criminal conduct. Um, and it's a very low standard of probable cause, and deliberately so, because FISA and the FISC exist in a constitutional shadow land. It involves, to some extent, very modest extent, intrusion by the Article III judiciary at the instruction of Congress into the zone of activity that is entirely the president's. Read Article II and you won't find the word judge in there. But also it acknowledges the concerns that everybody in this group so far, and probably most of you in the room, have about, well, you know, doesn't the Fourth Amendment play some role? particularly when you're talking about activities that can affect the interests of United States persons, U.S. citizens, or lawful resident aliens? And the answer to that, I think, is, is clearly yes. But in th I do not believe that it's necessary to create institutionally a structure, special advocate or whatever it is, that basically vets every single FISA application and has the opportunity to come in uh, and, and object to the uh, application or be heard on its behalf. One of the aspects of the FISA courts, the FISC operations, that I don't think is generally known to the public, and it's a very crucial part of the activity of the court, and that is the role of the legal advisors. Uh, when, I was, when I started, there was one. When I left, I think there were four, maybe five. I don't know how many are there now. Reflected the expanding workload. These people are highly experienced attorneys, very knowledgeable, probably any one of them knows more than all of us in the court at any given time together about various aspects of the law. But again, by rule, the, the government must submit at least seven days before an application is formally to be presented to a judge, it has to submit what colloquial is called a read copy. That's reviewed by the legal advisors. The legal advisors spend a great deal of time pushing back against the agencies and, and dealing both with the, with the uh, lawyers who appear on behalf of the agencies within the Justice Department and from the agencies themselves and directly dealing with the agencies. And you know, we're all aware that there's a very low turndown rate. Uh, and it seems to me also that a proposal that Congress might consider so, would be in a number of instances 
an application that is submitted for initial review and is reviewed and discussed uh, by a court's legal advisor may actually never be presented. And it seems to me that that's, that, in effect, is a turn down by the court, or at least an agents or, an, or agents working on behalf of the court. The government decides not to present that application. I don't know what that number is. Nobody does. I think, however, if that number were something that were registered and recorded and publicized, applications submitted but not formally presented, I think that the public, I would hope, uh, and those concerned about the court and its operations would have a better understanding of, in fact, it is an effective uh, institution. And uh, so that's essentially my proposal. Give the court either the discretion or require it in certain very limited circumstances to call upon outside counsel. There are some concerns that people can raise, and I, won't, I just want to touch upon one of them because I think it's a valid concern is, well, what happens when it comes before me from Toledo, Ohio, and I decide to call upon outside counsel? Well, I only sit every 11 weeks, give or take, depending upon the vagaries of our schedule. Um, do I come back and hear it, or does it simply go on to some other judge? Can't go to another judge, because once an application is presented to a particular one judge of the court, that judge, uh, that's his or her application. That, that's the cut down on judge shopping. Um, we do have, when I was a member of the, the, the Foreign Intelligence Advance Court, we had a secure area in our courthouse that was built out. There were fax machines, uh, you know, telephone, so forth, that all, all secure. So we have means of, of communicating, but it seemed to me that the instances of that circumstance are sufficiently unique and rare that, in fact, the particular judge, if I had to come back to D.C., fine, no problem. Alternatively, perhaps have the presiding judge of the court uh, select one of the judges to handle it or limit it to one of the three judges who is resident in the D.C. area. But uh, given the interest of time, I'll, I'll stop there. I, let me just say, by way of <coughs> closing argument in support of this. I think this kind of proposal it can be effective, can be efficient, and it can be inexpensive. And I think it will do as much as anything in this small area that we're talking about to improve the operation of the court and as well, I would hope, to enhance the public confidence that the court indeed uh, does its job, which is to stand at that somewhat indefinite crossroads between the Fourth Amendment and Article Two, in a very important area. Judge Carr, thank you so much, and the panelists all, thank you so much. We have time for questions, and I get the moderator's prerogative of starting us all off, but be thinking about yours in a, in a moment. First, David, I will go in the order of our, our <coughs> panelists. Um, I was going to ask you, because much has been made about the order of the revelations of the review group and then the president's speech and then the report. Um, what did you see? I know that was much more of a collaborative process, and I wanted to ask you what you saw of your conclusions and how they impacted the president's speech. But we've got to ask the question that Steve brought up, which is how many, how could so many judges have gotten this wrong? I mean, how do you reach such a different conclusion? What do you want to say about that? Um, sure. First, uh, before I address that, I just want to pick up on a point Steve reinforced, which is the lack of finding of abuse uh, in the intelligence community. Um, PCLAB found uh, nothing but dedicated men and women trying to protect this country and consider our civil liberties. And so our recommendations are more prospective concerns than trouble with any uh, activities we found in the government. Um, with regard to the 15 judges that have been cited, I think it's important to put in context how those judges came to their decisions. Um, as Judge Carr just said, um, judges like to have someone else in the room, uh, namely two parties, and that's how judges make up their mind. In those 15 cases, there was nobody else in the room besides the government um, to present uh, arguments. Um, also, as our report pointed out for the first time, there was never a written opinion analyzing the 215 program until 2013. And so none of those judges had considered prior precedents by their fellow judges on the FISC uh, with regard to their uh, analysis of point by point of um, why the government did or did not comply with 215. And again, it was only after all of that uh, took place that there was finally a decision. And so judges work, we heard from Judge Carr and Judge Robertson, judges work best in an adversary system 
particularly in the, this area where they're uh, making programmatic approvals. And, and that was simply lacking. So I don't disparage the judges at all. It's just that the court wasn't functioning as courts are designed to function with, with two sides present. <coughs> um, Judge Leon was pointed out. Uh, Judge Leon said, I'm not going to look at the statutory question of compliance. That's not my jurisdiction. That's the FISC's jurisdiction. I'm going to look at the constitutional question. And Judge Leon, in a very strongly worded opinion, found the program unconstitutional. Um, so there's really. Uh, we, and in some ways a blank slate about the uh, legality of the program, but again, given PCOB's statutory mandate to look at le legal compliance, we felt compelled to do so. So Steve, I agree that the telephony data cannot be, the standard cannot be, this is the only piece of evidence used to stand between me and the bomb. But tell us more about this evidence you think there is that there was any efficacy at all. The President's handpicked review group as well as the PCLOB both said programs aren't doing what they're supposed to be doing. Well, I don't think they said that. I mean, you didn't say that they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing. I think what they said was, uh, my reading is what is what I suggested, which is there's no specific case you can point to where this was the piece of evidence that prevented an attack. And again, my emphasis is that's not the right standard. That's not how counterterrorism investigations work. It's not how law enforcement investigations work. What this is is a what any business records order is. Uh, when any agency or law enforcement department asks for business records, it's the beginning of the investigation. It's in order to get the building blocks to find evidence that you put together when later you may use to get a search warrant, for example. So the question is, is it an input, an important input into counterterrorism investigations? And I think what it is a tool, it's a unique tool, one of the only ways the government has to discover new phone numbers that it didn't know about before that may be used by a terrorist organization or a terrorist cell in the United States. And these terrorists, are they, they know what they're doing. They know we're trying to detect them. They change phones all the time. And this, this is a quick, flexible tool to find those new connections, identify those new phone numbers, and then they're tipped to the FBI for follow-up as part of a larger counterterrorism investigation. All these investigations are like jigsaw puzzles and they involve many, many pieces. This is one little piece in the puzzle. But I think even that input into the puzzle is an important contribution. And of course, if it's the one essential input, you'll never really know whether this is the one essential input. It's an input. And the end result may be the prevention of an attack or the discovery of a new cell or a plot. That's incredibly uh, important. And if this is a unique capability, then I think that's enough to say it's, it's uh, it's necessary. Can, may I speak to that, please, for a moment? Yes. <laughs> because I agree absolutely. I think, keep in mind, <clears throat> I think that it is the wrong question. It's setting up the opposite of a straw man, perhaps an iron man, to ask, well, point to the terrorist attack that was stopped. It's impossible. This is precursor information. This is information that you acquire in order to determine whether contacts appear to be such that further investigation is necessary. And in describing it, so I'm not talking about how it works for FISA, I'm talking about how it works with an ordinary Title III law enforcement surveillance. In every one of those applications I've ever seen, there's pen register data. Now you can talk about the extent of the collection, the volume, retention, and so period, so forth. But don't ask the question, show us the case, show us the building that didn't get knocked down, the city that didn't go up in flames. That's the wrong question to ask. But at least in the ordinary law enforcement context, and we're very careful here not to obviously disclose anything classified, but it, it, it's a beginning point. It's not an end point. And quite often, and I've issued lots of pen register orders as an Article III judge, nothing happens. Why? Because it turns out the contact that they believe that they could, the contacts they could show between a suspected set of drug dealers don't exist. And so that actually in that way it protects the interests of those people from further being the subject of a Title III surveillance order. Michelle, you had something to add. Yeah, and l let me just jump in to say though that this idea that this is the only way to get phone numbers is not correct. You could use 215 in a more targeted fashion Right? You could start with a seed, a hop or two. You could do a national security letter. 
You could do a FISA PIN register. You could do a criminal PIN register. You can do a criminal subpoena. This is something that can be picked up over otherwise legitimate wiretaps. This is not the only tool. I think so much has been put into whether this one program is the only way to obtain this information, and it's just simply not. It absolutely is not. There are other ways to get this information, including in emergency circumstances. There are emergency valves in both the foreign intelligence and criminal investigative tools, so that if there is ever a ticking bomb scenario, you can get the records and the content without going through this process, which is very, very important. Um, I, I think one of the things, though, that was really helpful in the PCLOB is that they did look at the cases that the white papers and legal briefs relied on to say that this is just analogous to what everything is going on in the criminal investigation side. And they found that not to be true, that while there are um, administrative or criminal subpoenas, they are not literally every record produced by an entire industry every day for seven years directly to the NSA. There's absolutely nothing of this precedent in any realm, whether it's intelligence or um, criminal. And so that that analogy isn't right. And I'll, I'll finally just wrap up with, does it matter if these prevent attacks? I'm sorry, but what other question can there possibly be? That is the point of our national security programs when they are operating domestically. Um, you know, you could look at Fort Hood. You could look at the Boston Marathon. You could look at the underwear bomber. We had tips on all three of those people. Some of them were subject to actual wiretaps, and we did not act on them because we are digging through everyday Americans' internet and phone records without any results. You know, if this is really about successful national security programs, you have to think, is this the best use of our resources and our time? Are the 22 analysts who dig through these stupid phone records better used elsewhere? Because obviously we're not using the actionable tips we get, and this is a problem. That's ultimately what the 9-11 report said. There's a little bit of revisionist history. The 9-11 report and the Senate Judiciary Committee report did not say, go out there and collect more. It said, connect the dots you have. Stop this interagency infighting and put together all this great intelligence you're getting. And if there's another 9-11 and another 9-11 report, it's going to find the exact same thing because our government is obsessed with collecting more information instead of using the actionable information it has. David and then Steve. Um, and then I, questions from the audience. Thanks. I don't um, disagree with Judge Carr's or Steve's um, analysis, which is that the, it's, not, it's not enough to say, did it stop a, a plot, but did it make a contribution? <laughs> um, so in evaluating the government's claims of success regarding the 215 program, uh, we looked at those claims carefully. We also had access to classified information as a background for those claims. We wrote up our analysis, and we asked the intelligence community to check us factually, uh, which they did and which we appreciate. Um, but our conclusion was that not only did it not thwart plots and identify terrorists, but even the uh, added value of p connecting the dots or putting links together, um, either it wasn't there or the other tools were available for the government to, to do the same thing, uh, and that the program did not add value in terms of e efficiency or speed, um, uh, wh whereas other programs, uh, other legal regimes would provide the same information. And so we just overall, regarding all those criteria, did not see a value of the program, particularly in light of its privacy and civil liberties concerns, and given the fact that the, there were other tools available to get substantially the same information. Thank you, David. Steve? Well, just quickly, um, I don't believe there is a way for the government to get these connections through other means uh, in, any, in anything approaching an efficient and quick way. Um, it's not the case that they could simply serve individual business records orders targeted at particular numbers to individual telephone companies and get the same information. Telephone companies each keep their own separate data records about which numbers their customers have called, and they keep those records for billing purposes only for a few months. What this program enables the NSA to do uniquely is to assemble the data records from multiple carriers, put them in a common searchable format, and preserve the data for a period of years so you can do the necessary historical analysis. If it's very important information if that phone number is associated with a group of 
terrorist suspects you were investigating three or four years ago that were involved in a particular plot, and now you've put the pieces together and you see, ah, this number was associated with that plot back then. That's critical information input into a counterterrorism investigation, and this database enables that kind of analysis of connections and patterns in calling. And that's a critical tool that's not available through individualized orders. It simply can't can't be done, certainly not efficiently and effectively. And in terms of the, the usefulness and utility, I think one metric I haven't heard discussed in public, I'd be interested to know the answer, is we all know that every morning the President of the United States hears a report on the latest, most significant threats facing the United States and the latest intelligence. That's the presidential daily brief. I wonder how many of those items that the president hears about in his presidential daily brief have, have had some input, any input, from this program in terms of connecting the dots with phone numbers. It's not going to be revealed in the report itself, but if it's been an input into an item that is important enough to be presented to the president in his daily brief, I think that's an important metric that might be very revealing in terms of the usefulness of the, of the program. Thank you all, and I'll turn to the audience. Jody was first. I'm Jody Weston. Um, for, I've worked for about nine years with the Department of Homeland Security advising them on legal policy issues with cybersecurity R&D. And I work very closely with the cybersecurity community, the research community across the nation. Let me tell you that metadata, as much as the administration would like to say it is harmless to metadata, it is actually far more useful than content. So this concept of content is, oh, that's the juice, and this just really doesn't matter, it is completely the opposite. So when I don't hear any numbers of the number of presidential daily briefings that this data supported, the number of terrorists that it's even identified, and then I hear about all the bills on the Hill, and I see how NSA keeps stepping in the traps they were shown the test for, and I'm clear the NSA does not know all that he has. Their security program is so bad they don't know what he has. And they keep saying, oh, we're only doing this, and then here comes more. Oh, well, we'll backtrack from that. Here's some more, and there's more to come. So why haven't any of you called for an independent counsel? Really? Do you really want Congress to act on legislation when we only know these little bits of information? I don't think that's wise. I don't think we want Congress passing legislation based on the little bit that we know. So where are our voices calling for an independent counsel? So this community, this uh, uh, public, this Congress can have some real facts to make some informed decisions. I'll jump in. Uh, first of all, there's no independent counsel statute anymore. That was sunsetted. The provision would be uh, a special prosecutor, a special counsel that would be appointed by the Attorney General under longstanding regulations of the Justice Department. There's no grounds or basis to appoint a special prosecutor unless there's reason to believe laws have been broken. And nobody here, I believe, is making any colorable claim other than Edward Snowden and a few that any U.S. laws have been broken by any of the programs that have been disclosed. The intelligence committees in Congress are very aware of all of these programs and the leaders on both sides of the aisle of the intelligence committees have stood up and defended the programs and the need for the programs. So, you can debate the policy. I think it's a very healthy debate. We can talk about whether there should be an evolution in privacy law and in Fourth Amendment doctrine about reasonable expectations of privacy. I think these are extremely healthy, good debates to have for the country, and it's a real education. I think it's historic, actually, uh, notwithstanding the damage that I do think the disclosures have done. But I don't think there's any serious argument that anybody has intentionally broken the law, and for that reason, I don't see uh, any basis for the appointment of a special prosecutor or the opening of a, of a criminal investigation. Um, 
Do you yeah, I just want to briefly add that, I, I mean, I hope the Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board as an independent bipartisan board um, is addressing as it has done with the 215 program and we are just embarking on a study of the 702 program, um, which we have the hope to have the results in the next couple of months, uh, at least sheds light on those programs. And I think we've proven our independence and in that we've, we've been free to speak our mind and draw whatever conclusions we deem appropriate. I think why we continue to push Congress on this issue, because despite what the president said in his speech, the intelligence community has fought this like every step of the way. And not just substantive changes, but even meaningful disclosures, like you said, they're not getting out in front of this and leading the debate and explaining what they do and how it affects everyday people. They're just sort of in defense mode, right? And you get the president giving a speech, and all he says is, you know what, I'm going to look into a different way to do this. In less than 24 hours, anonymous sources in the Washington Post are, cut him off at the knees, right? His own intelligence community is saying this will never work. We can't make any changes. We'll, we'll oppose and fight to the death over anything. And I think the only people vis-a-vis -vis the administration who has the authority, um, because they have the sunsets coming next year on 215 and in 27 on the FISA Amendments Act, that they have room to negotiate and you know operate vis-a-vis -vis the administration. As far as investigations, we're very much looking forward to the 702 report, because that's the harder question, right? And things like... Um, operations under the executive order um, and other programs, you know, it, it's incredibly dense. We don't know how it works on a practical level. Some of these leaks seem to be contradictory or maybe came from entities who don't actually know the full extent of the programs. And so this is an area where it's um, almost completely in the dark and it is hard to legislate around. And I think that's why the bills really focus more on the domestic Patriot Act authorities as opposed to the international ones. I mean, I think Congress should consider a select committee, you know, go back to the church committee model where you would pull from judiciary and intelligence with a presumption of openness, you know, making substantive and holistic reforms. Um, but we'll see if Congress has a stomach for that. You know, I'm really suspicious that they don't. I think they like plausible deniability on a lot of these programs, frankly. Can, can I add? Actually, this this was extremely half baked, maybe not even mixed. But it occurs to me, listening to this discussion, as I understand the, the the FISA statute, it didn't give me discretion to say, "Gee, I don't think you ought to be looking at this guy or that guy." Once there was probable cause, uh, I was required to is issue the order. However, in this area, when you've got something new and novel, a new sort of program, if it's not presently in the statute, perhaps it could be. That is an explicit. Uh, uh, authorization to a court when it, when something it has approved a new and novel program, like the metadata program, the prison program, at least gives the, the court the express authority to require a periodic review of that program. I mean, one other metric is how often has metadata acquired from this program found its way into a FISA application. I have no idea, and some of your thoughts about in terms of other kinds of identification. But it seems to me within the context of the court, and the court does have authority to say, uh, you know, tell me this or tell me that, uh, at least I think inherently. But again, that's simply a suggestion. It's academic. Once again, I'm not talking as a judge, but it occurs to me in this conversation in terms of, well, how do we find out whether this program is, is, is in fact worthwhile and, and, and in the balance between the impact upon a the public perception of the legitimacy of what the court and the agencies and executive are all doing b in terms of public confidence in terms of the security of its own data that necessarily is, is giving up and providing well in time you can you know, authorize it for a period and then say no wait a minute let's take a look at this provide us with this kind of information and of course surprise, it seems to me that's the kind of function that an outside attorney could help the court um, uh, perform and function. Just a thought. Thank you, Judge Carr. There was a question in the back? No? Yes, thank you. So, uh, Mike Bergen, top of the system. You brought up a good point on the idea of perception and confidence, and we can debate the privacy issues back and forth.
talk to what's being done based on the perspective side to help you with this? Because they're trying to stop more I could jump in on that. Um, well, I, I think that the president really tried to address that in his, uh, some of his policy proposals. I think he was really had in mind the uh, tech companies and their commercial interests as well as our diplomatic relations with foreign countries. Now this really gets to the international piece of it and the content collection both overseas under executive order and in the Section 702 program, which not the telephone metadata program. And uh, I think the president is putting at least policy restrictions. You can debate how restrictive they really are, but some some at least nominal restrictions on the the reasons for and the bases of bulk collection overseas, and also extending as a policy matter protections that we usually apply to U.S. person data to the data of non-U.S. persons collected even outside the United States. Those are pretty extraordinary steps. Now, there are qualifications to that. It needs to be consistent with the needs of national security, et, et cetera. So you can, you can debate, and then it'll have to be worked out in terms of how those policies work. But I think those are efforts to give some comfort to the users of those networks. Some of those U.S. Internet companies have 80-plus percent of their users outside the United States. And, of course, there's a great reaction from foreign governments that trying to take advantage of that. But these ideas that data would be housed in foreign countries and that somehow that would make it more secure is really almost laughable. I mean, there's no country in the world that has the restrictions we have under the Fourth Amendment and in terms of collection that goes on in the U.S., the requiring the prior approval of judges, independent judges on the FISA court. There's no other country in the world that requires judge approval for its intelligence agencies to do this kind of surveillance. You've got the Chinese, the Russians, European governments that do collection. Anywhere outside the U.S., data is less secure and more subject to surveillance than it is in the U.S. So. Uh, somehow that message needs to be needs to be communicated because I think uh, actually those companies have a great advantage in terms of data privacy from functioning in the U.S. Michelle, um, we can yeah. look Michelle and then David. Sure, sir. Yeah. I know we're running out of time, but I've, I've got to say that um, you call it a perception program problem, right? And as long as that is the attitude, it's not going to be fixed because it's not a perception. It is what the government is actually doing. It's substantive. You know, they, they may have different values than us, but especially the Europeans have very advanced privacy programs and privacy officers, and they're not going to be fooled by a speech, and we're going to look to see if there are substantive changes in policy and law. And so as long as this is seen as something to manage as a PR problem, um, you know, it's just not, it's not going to be fixed. You know, I think they're one step ahead of that. David's going to have to get the last word. Any other questions, please come up. And thank you again, panelists. Um, thanks. just want to add that PCLAB's report last week uh, recommended that, that companies have greater ability to disclose information about government requests as part of our overall transparency recommendations. And as people may have seen yesterday, the Department of Justice entered into an agreement with a number of companies, uh, giving them greater flexibility to disclose what's going on. And I think in many cases, knowing what's going on will actually give greater comfort to uh, U.S. companies' business partners overseas. And if I may, yes, okay, judge. <laughs> one thing I, I would urge everybody to kind of keep in mind, I alluded to this before, we don't know the constitutionality of FISA, whether in fact Congress can authorize the Article III judiciary to play any role whatsoever in the government, in, in the executive's decisions about how best to conduct our foreign affairs and protect our country. FISA and the FISC are a tripartite compromise between the three branches of government. <coughs> As a citizen, I am concerned that if proposals are enacted by Congress that potentially have the effect of impairing the work either of FISA or much more or FISC, or much more importantly, from the executive standpoint, of adversely affecting the effectiveness of uh, foreign intelligence ga information gathering, intelligence gathering, do we really want fine constitutional lines drawn in this shadow land? My point simply is I think we should be cautious and keep in mind that it's not just the Fourth Amendment to which I believe we are all dedicated. I think I certainly am. 
but it is also the Article II authority of the President under the Constitution, which is exclusive, to protect us all from foreign governments when they have malign purposes and foreign-based terrorist organizations and threats. And the judge will get the last word. Thank you all to the panelists. Thank you for staying.